thank you for coming. Um, I would also like to uh, thank the German consulate for having me here in this wonderful room. And I'd also like to thank Lufthansa for uh, co-sponsoring this. <coughs> I'll read a little bit of, uh, of, the, of the book to you, and you must realize it is a non-fictional book. So some of it may seem like fiction, but it actually isn't, okay? Now let me just start with something um, from Australia. So this is just the beginning of a chapter. On the first day of creation, the ground split and the ancestors climbed from the cracks. Some took the form of men, others the form of animals. They wandered off in all directions across the globe, singing, playing, hunting, and creating all earthly things. When their work was done, the era of Al Hiringa, dream time was done. The ancestors froze in their tracks as lizards became mountains, ants became cliffs, and bats became dark caves. The places where these formations can still be seen are sacred to Australia's Aboriginal peoples. For 40,000 years in Australia, nomadic tribes have been following in their ancestors' footsteps, which crisscross the red continent like a fine mesh. In seasonal cycles, Aborigines set off on foot, sometimes traversing thousands of kilometers. They pause at the holy sites along the way during walkabouts and gather for ceremonies to summon up the power of souls alive in such places. In 1957, a young woman named Eddie Milpuddy was on such a walkabout with her family. Her journey had commenced two years previously in the Everard Ranges in Central Australia. And the route to her final destination, the Aldea Settlement in the south, took her straight through the outback. It's hard to imagine a more hostile environment. Temperatures in summer exceed 50 degrees Celsius, while in winter they drop below freezing. There's hardly any vegetation. Only a few trees provide shade, and rivers are non-existent. Eddie and her husband and children lived on rabbits and lizards that they caught in traps. They drank from hidden water holes they found using song lines, the lyrics of which list landmarks that the Aborigines used to navigate along the invisible paths of their ancestors. At some point, Eddie and her family entered the land of the Churacha. There they found a number of strange signs covered, uh, <coughs> covered in characters that neither Eddie nor her husband, neither of whom spoke English, could decipher. The signs read, warning, you are entering a radioactive area. Eddie and her family pressed on, and when night began to fall, they looked around for a good spot to set up camp eventually finding a large circular hollow that offered shelter against the wind. But the spot was not as peaceful as it seemed. When the sun had set completely and the mill puddies had lain down to sleep, they were startled awake by a sudden din of motors. Seconds later, all Tehran vehicles appeared at the edge of the craters, and soldiers in overalls jumped out. White men yelling in a language Eddie didn't understand forced her and her family to get in one of the vehicles. After a while, they reached a symmetrically laid out settlement of barracks. The white fellas ordered Eddie and her family to stand under a stream of water. It was the first shower of their lives. Once they dried themselves off, the mill parties were examined with a Geiger counter and then sent back under the water. This frightening procedure was repeated four or five times. In the end, the soldiers gave the mill parties some clothing and left them in peace. <clears throat> in the end, the soldiers gave the mill puddy, oh, sorry. Outside, however, <clears throat> the family's four valuable hunting dogs were shot. Eddie Milpaldi was pregnant at the time of this incident, but she lost the baby. Her second child died of a brain tumor at the age of two, and her third was born prematurely and only barely survived. She blamed ra radioactive contamination in the soil. The crater in which the family had camped out had been created a few months previously, by a 1.5 kiloton atomic bomb that had been detonated in the desert. Marku 1 was part of the British nuclear program, which in the 1950s moved from the developmentals uh, to this test stage. The Clement Attlee government in, At in London had selected Australia as its test site because it considered it uninhabited. But no one had considered the fact 
that an aboriginal path might lead directly through the test zone. Now, I go on to describe that this whole area, which is absolutely huge, we're talking of something like, you know, the state of New Jersey, that kind of area, which they used as a bombing range. There was only a single person assigned to clear it uh, of, of aboriginal people migrating through the area. So there was only one man responsible for that. And uh, I must also say that it's very unfair for me to get up on this pulpit and, and, and kind of pick on the British because uh, this idea of places that were used as bombing ranges for, ranges for nuclear tests, that they're uninhabited, is not singular to the British nuclear program. I mean, the Soviets did it in, in Kazakhstan. They, they said that that place was uninhabited. It wasn't. Uh, and they set off, uh, I think, almost 500 nuclear weapons there. Um, uh, I'm sure the Chinese did something similar. Uh, the United States in Nevada, the Pacific, Bikini Atoll, you know, so it's unfair of me to, to pick on the Brits. Um, all this research uh, I put into it is, is, is of course, um, to some extent informed by the fact that I still remember some of these follies myself. I was born in 1973 and sort of caught the tail end of the Cold War. Uh, you know, which had a lot of surprises in store uh, for us, uh, some of it which were very scary. Uh, I mean, I remember the, the early 80s, a Korean jetliner was shot down, maybe some of you will remember that, and it really looked as if the war was about to break out, and as if Germany would be the battleground where it would happen. Um, I mean, that was supposed to be, or was seemed to be designated as the, the battleground for a future nuclear war. So I do remember that. I remember a classmate of mine, he, um, he had a rich dad and they were, they were digging a nuclear shelter in the garden. Uh, I remember my uncle, he, had, he showed me in the fridge, he had like uh, uh, sort of suicide pills, like sleeping pills, which he said he'd take if the missiles would come in. He said, I, you know, I, I don't want to see that happen, so I'm going to take those pills. And uh, I, remember, uh, I remember Chernobyl as well, because Bavaria was affected by some of that fallout and you know, being in school and the prefect going around with the Geiger counter. So these are the memories of my youth, strange as they may seem to young people or people who are younger than me today. I'm just going to skip on and uh, read you some more from another chapter. Uh, we'll move on to the U.S. Um, one of the interesting things is during the Cold War, there were so many nuclear weapons, but they actually lost about 40 of them. I mean, about 40 of them went down with subs or they, planes crashed uh, and, and or they, they, various things happened or they got severely damaged or they tried to find them and couldn't find them. And uh, the code name for that is Broken Arrows. So I'm just going to read you the beginning of that uh, chapter after I've had a little sip of water. Okay, so Miles Bluff, a small South Carolina village, snugly surrounded by pine woods, it's just about the most peaceful place imaginable. If you take the main road eastward, at some point you'll come upon the Hamlet's PD in Ketchup Town. About 15 miles further on is Florence, the nearest small city in the region. This is typical backwards America, sleepy and seemingly endless. During the afternoon of March 11th, 1958, a rail conductor named Walter Gregg was piddling around in his yard while his nine-year-old daughter, Helen Elizabeth, and Frances Mabel played with their cousin, Ella Davis. At approximately 4.30 p.m., Greg heard the roar of three B-47 jets. That was nothing unusual. There was a big Air Force base across the Georgia border, and pilots often flew sorties over the sparsely populated areas in inland South Carolina. Greg watched the planes for a bit and went into his garage. Just then, there was a massive explosion. For a minute, the conductor thought the sky was falling. Smoke was everywhere. <clears throat> when the fumes and the stench had cleared, Greg saw a scene of total devastation. One wall of his garage was missing. The roof of his house had been completely blown off, and a car that a salesman happened to be driving by had been picked up and turned around 180 degrees. There was a crater. 22 meters wide in Greg's backyard, and in the middle of it was a partially destroyed Mark 36 atomic bomb. This was the same model that had been dropped on Nagasaki. Although the Mars Bluff warhead was more modern, 
powerful and dangerous. When the tear-shaped bomb had hit the ground in Greg's backyard, 